All right, we've reached the top of the hour. So once again, hello, welcome to the September edition of the 3D Experience User Group meeting. I'm Nick Sweeney, and I'm just going to introduce everything, and then we'll kind of get this kicked off. Uh, this month, we've got some presentations uh, specifically talking about collaboration. We're going to be diving into uh, how we can use some of our groups on the 3D Experience platform, what that really does for us so that we can, we can track our project milestones and so that we can actually do things in a very collaborative way. So a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, all of the attendees, you are all in listen-only mode, uh, but if you have any questions at all, uh, please feel free to use the chat, use the QA, uh, just shoot that over and then we'll try to answer those as we go. But I'm gonna pass it over to Keith and let him take it away. Thanks, Nick. Um, can you see my screen? See my PowerPoint slide? Yes, I can. Awesome, all right. We're gonna assume everything's good. Um, so for my section of this, uh, we're gonna walk through uh, user groups, uh, how, do you, how to create them, how to set them up, uh, what they're good for, uh, the kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. As we go through this though, uh, there's a couple of tangents that, that we may, I know Nick, uh, I'm, so I'm the guy here that likes to talk a lot. So I'm gonna try and keep those tangents to a minimum, um, but of course, um, there are a couple of things that I'm going to add in here as we walk through the, the admin tool, specifically when we start adding roles and, and whatnot to these user groups. Um, overall, uh, user groups are really simple to use. Um, over the past uh, probably month or so, I've been going back with some of our internal tenants and cleaning them up, creating user groups, um, and even going back to some of our customers and saying, hey, we want to we switch the way the user group is working a little bit. Um, user groups are now part of our standard implementation process uh, for, for both our team and our enterprise implementations. We create user groups so that uh, as, we, as we onboard uh, customers, uh, we can quickly allow them to invite users to their platform and get that initial setup kind of pumped out right away. Um, and to do it in a, in a quick process that, allow, uh, that allows the customer to not really think about it a whole lot. Um, it, it's a really simple process that we'll kind of walk through uh, as we create these user groups. So again, we're going we're gonna to walk through a couple of things, and this is kind of my, uh, my list of topics for the day. Um, uh, the, the use cases and, and, and creating. Uh, assigning roles, so licensing uh, and user setup, uh, assigning collaborative spaces, so this is permissions uh, related, um, some tips and tricks uh, for the user groups and adding users to the user groups. Uh, and uh, we're gonna touch a little bit on the change process. I don't plan on going super deep into the change process, um, but uh, if, there are, if there are some questions about that process at the very end and we have time, uh, we can by all means dive into it. Uh, so. When we're looking at some of the use cases, uh, this is kind of the, the list that I came up, to, came up with for our user groups. Um, simplifying user creation um, and standardizing those settings. So that's a big one here is that we, we really want to be able to take uh, the settings of those user groups and push them through um, to automatically add to that role assignment, the permissions on the 3D spaces, uh, the dashboards and the tasks that happen uh, as a part of that. So what we're gonna do is first off, look at where is user groups. So user groups are actually part of the collaborative business innovator license. So this is your core license that, that comes in on the platform. This is the very basis. So pretty much everybody has the ability to, to see and create user groups. Um, now, that being said, depending on the permissions associated with that specific group, um, they may not even see that group if it's a private group. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that going forward. Uh, one thing to note real quick is that uh, the user groups, uh, when they're set up, if you have multiple tenants, not that many people have multiple tenants, but if you do have multiple tenants, they're on a per tenant basis. So they are specific to the tenant that you're running with, uh, which means, and I'm gonna use my pointer even though Nick is gonna yell at me because you never use your pointer, right? Um, that down arrow here, you need to make sure that when you're gonna fire up your user group, um, you wanna make sure that you're set to the correct tenant moving forward. 
Um, and on the phone, we I know Bob and Todd are somewhere here in the background. So if you guys have something to add as we go forward, um, or if you're watching the chat and something pops up, just let me know, all right? Sure, thank you. All right, thank you. So when we go into the user groups, this is the, the screen you're gonna see. And I'm gonna kind of roll through these kind of quick because uh, I have my tenant up in the background. We're gonna create a couple of user groups uh, live for you. Uh, and kind of walk through the process a little bit better. But uh, if you go ahead and click on that icon, this is about what you're gonna get. Um, and you can see my user groups are either by by my groups or all user groups. Again, you, my groups are the groups that I have ownership of. Um, and then all groups are everything that I can see inside the platform. Now you can also filter these and, and pull them down uh, depending on what you're looking for. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, there's not that many groups in here that that makes it super uh, super confusing. So my groups are going to be pretty pretty simple and straightforward. Um, by default, when I create that group, I'm the main owner, um, which means that I can assign managers to it. And I'll show you where to do that in just a second. Um, but from this dialog box, we can create new user groups. Um, we can also import groups from a file, and you can see the, the icons right above the, the CATI AE group there. Um, if you pick on them, there's a new group one, and there's an import group from file. Um, the import group from file is, is somewhat ex important because I can quickly duplicate groups from there. Um, and uh, in the next screen, you're gonna see that uh, once groups are created, I have the ability to export them from a file. So we can quickly grab you know, an export from one group, tweak the number of members that are in it, tweak what we see in it, um, and basically import that into a new group if we want a separate group uh, to be created. So here we are in that example. So if I jump in here, uh, there's a couple of responsibilities here, right? Um, and you're gonna notice that in this case or in this scenario, I've added uh, Bob and Randy, sorry, Todd, um, I've added Bob and Randy as managers on this group. So the manager has the ability to edit the group. They can add users, they can remove users. Um, and at that point, uh, the owner is the one who can actually uh, manage the group itself. So we can change the group name, change this group description, and uh, turn on and off the managers of the group itself. Uh, so he can add additional managers if need be. my manager list. So once the group is created, if you go ahead and click on the members tab at the top of that box, uh, what you'll end up seeing is just a list of all the members on your platform. And if you go to the to the member uh, dialog there and just start typing, uh, again, it's 3D experience, so you need to have at least three characters uh, is the typical search. Um, once you get past that three three characters, it should start giving you uh, suggestions on, on on who to add to that to that group, um, and you can add your members directly from this box, um, and you can add multiple members in inside of that same same range. So I'm gonna come back and we're gonna fire up my platform. So here's my platform. Um, this platform is pretty straightforward. Uh, it is almost out of the box. Uh, there's only a few little tweaks in it. I've added a couple members to it. Uh, and I'm gonna quickly go to the members uh, because I wanna show you uh, one of the scenarios that we're gonna run into here. And that is, you're gonna see that from my membership on this platform, uh, that there's several members that are still pending. So pending means they've been invited to the platform, but have yet to log in. Um, so. If they haven't logged in yet, the passport account the passport account has not yet been uh, been added to that user, uh, and therefore uh, they're kind of a, uh, a half user on the platform. They're actually added by their email address uh, it, from the invite members box. Uh, in this case, you're also going to notice that I'm adding users, and you can see the little key icon next to them in the platform management here. Um, and this is telling me that they're actually bringing their license from another tenant. So I'm using that, that bring your own license uh, option, which is actually really cool in 3D experience. If you're sharing platforms or sharing uh, data uh, from a collaborative st standpoint with another company or another division, this is a great way to do it without having to buy multiple licenses uh, across both platforms for one person. 
Um, so Bob, in this case, Bob's going to use his his license from another platform. Um, but again, I guess my point here is to understand which ones are pending. Bob and Randy are both pending. Uh, Braden is also pending. And if you look at Todd, he's already logged in. Matt has already logged in. So they get their, their full member status uh, without the pending log. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to flip back to my, my standard CAD user. And I'm going to bring up my user group. Now, I've cheated and I've created a, a dashboard tab just for my user groups. Uh, so we'll go ahead and load up my my users tab on that. And what you're going to see is there's no groups yet. So this one is, is a bare platform. I'm just going to tell the system that I want to create a new one. And we're going to call this uh, Go AE Team. And we can... You don't have to have you don't have to have a description, but we're going to put it in there anyway. All right. So when I go ahead and select on that, you're going to see I'm going to get my my option to add members. I'll go ahead and say that I want to add maybe Bob. Now you're going to notice that Bob doesn't have any results. Uh, I'm going to go back to Todd. You remember Todd had already logged in, right? So here's Todd. Notice that when I click on Todd, he comes in. So, um, so Matt was already logged in as well. So I'm going to start typing Matt. And you can see it's automatically finding his passport account. Uh, Bob, what's your uh, what's your passport email? I think it's just bob.m, right? Or bob.mcgoy? Yeah, bob.mcgoy. You can see that instead of instead of putting in just his username if you could spell my last name right I? yeah no it's mc oh jeez g a u g h e y maybe i should have maybe i should have chose randy at, at cgi.com oh, actually at, at, at mcgoy.com would be interesting i'd love to have that domain so notice when I put his email address in, though, it now understands that I'm trying to go to that pending user. So I, if you put it in by full email address, if the user is still pending, you can still add that user to a group. Um, I'm going to bring this up later again, and, and I'll explain why it's important. Um, but this allows me to basically push back to that, that pending user. And when that user signs in, it'll actually attach to their passport. So I'm just going to add this for the time being. And you can see here's my here's my users. And if I wanted Todd to be a, a manager of this group, I'm gonna go to the responsibilities tab and we'll say maybe Todd. <laughs> Todd. There he is. Now we can make Todd a manager. So he can manage the group if we wanted to. Todd could add add members to the group as well. Okay, so it's pretty simple creating the group. Um, really easy right so let's come back i'm going to flip back to my powerpoint for a second because we're going to we're going to go through the next section here so bear with me so assigning groups to roles so in this case i've i've fired up another um another role so this is actually you know i'll show you this in a second coming from uh the members tab of the platform admin Okay, so these are the individual roles that are available from the platform admin. And when I click on the groups, uh, you'll see that I can add the user group onto the groups portion of this, this license. So basically what's gonna happen here is, remember I've just invited these users to the platform. And if I add them to a group and then add the 3D creator role to the group, I can now assign those licenses by group. So now I don't have to go back to each one of those users or go through this this and, and search out each user. As long as they're in that, as long as they're in that uh, that user group, they'll be assigned their, their license. Notice in this second dialog box uh, that the users that are assigned by that group will end up with a little icon next to them. So here's the little group icon. So let's go ahead and, and, and do that. I'm gonna flip back again. And we're going to go to the platform management, right? So, Keith, while you're doing this, I go just ahead. logged. 
So Keith, while you're doing this, I just logged in and accepted my invite. Yep, you're no longer pending. You're good. I am, I am no longer pending. And I currently have IFW and CSV. Yep, because I, and that's because I assigned these, your IFW and CSV beforehand. Yep. Uh, because I wanted those licenses to be shared from you. I didn't want the system to assign them. So I put those in there ahead of time. Understood. Um, so I'm going to go to 3D Creator here, and I'm just going to click on the little I for 3D Creator. And inside of the, the groups, you'll see all of these, these users that are available. But inside of the groups, uh, I'm going to come back here, and I'm just going to go to the GoATE team. We'll add those three members. We'll say OK to that. And now I've said OK. I'm going to flip back to the members, it's going to want me to refresh. But you can see it's already starting to add those and, pending users in. And, and Keith, I just got a notification that you added that to us. And I Perfect. did too. I now have 3D Creator in my roles list. Awesome. So again, now, super easy. I can push those licenses out to any of the users in the group. So Keith, quick question for anybody that might be familiar with Solid Speeding. I know we don't necessarily want to compare 3D experience to the platform or 3D experience to PDM because they do very different things. But is this kind of in the same realm of, you know, when we're creating groups inside of PDM to assign role or to assign uh, permissions and what they can do, this is kind of the same way. We say, hey, we're all CAD users, so we're going to give you all 3D creators so that we can assign them in mass um, and it's easier to manage them. Is that kind of the reason behind this? Kind of, yeah. So, so, and you're going to see as we go forward that this is this is assigning the license, though, Nick. It hasn't actually assigned the permissions to the data. Does that make sense? So, yeah. you're, this gives you your license. What we're going to do next is we're going to come through and say, okay, now, now I have these users that have 3D Creator. Where are they going to put their data, or what data can they search and see? Uh, from the system. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come back and I'm going to flip back to my PowerPoint again. Is we're going to talk about collaborative spaces, right? So if we if we understand collaborative spaces, I'm going to give my short little overview just so everyone's still with me. Um, so a collaborative space allows me to control permissions to see specific data, right? So in 3D experience, all of that data is in a bucket. And if you look at a collaborative space, we can split the data into separate collaborative spaces inside that bucket. And from there, I can say that users only have the ability to see one space and not the other, or they can see in both spaces, but they only have right access to another, right? So I can start making those, those kind of designations as far as uh, rights to, to be able to search data, to be able to view data, and to be able to write data at that point. So, so Keith, on, on my end of the fence right now, as a new user to the platform, I only have common space. Yes, so, and that's a really good, that's a really good point, thing to point out. So, for example, um, common space, I, I generally don't, th there's an option inside of the admin. I'm going to flip over, Bob. Hey, if I go over, this is Bob's fault. Um, but this is, this is actually pretty important. Um, so, if I go back over, and it's going to be under, I'm going to go back to 3D space. And number one. Content. 3D space. Yeah, there's, a, there's an option to automatically uh, attach common space when a user is created. And I think it's, I think it's just in the 3D space. It, it actually might, might be over here in content. So in content on collaborative spaces, I'm going to just shrink this down a little bit. So there it is. Give access to all new users to the common space. Okay. Generally, I say this is a bad thing. Um, I want my users to have specific access to a specific space, not just one common space. Um, that being said, uh, we know that SolidWorks, if you're using Toolbox, those files are going to go into the common space. Uh, they have to. There's no other option at this point. So if you have users that are going to be using Toolbox, you need to leave this turned on and make sure that those users have leader rights 
I'm sorry, author, at least author rights to the common space. Because what's gonna happen is when they create new variations of hardware, it's automatically gonna save that, that hardware into the common space. And if they don't have access, it's gonna error. That's gonna be a problem. So I would say you can leave this turned on uh, if you're using Toolbox. If you're not using Toolbox, my preference is to turn it off and keep everybody in one neat and tidy space. And that being said- gonna, If you're gonna yeah, do go that too, you might as well disable the ability to create your own common space. I mean, your own collaborative spaces as well. Yeah, I see, I turn that one off by default. I don't want everyone <laughs> creating their own spaces, uh, even though internally, a lot of times we, our EEs have their own spaces. Uh, when it comes to collaborative spaces, you want as many as you need, um, but as few as possible, okay? Generally, when you start getting too many collaborative spaces, it gets confusing, stuff gets pushed into the wrong space, and it becomes more of a problem than a solution. Um, so you want to, as many as required to get the proper, uh, the proper control over the data, but as, as few as you need to, to get there, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Um, so collaborative spaces. I'm gonna go back to the 3D space here. Uh, I'm gonna go back to this app. And uh, again, I'm gonna make sure in this case that I'm on the right tenant, which is gonna help me out. And then I'm gonna fire this thing up. So this is my collaborative space. Uh, right now I'm actually working in the, in the demo space, but if we go here to our production space, um, inside of our production space, I'm gonna hit this little I over here, and you're gonna see that one of the information is members. And so inside of members, I can do a couple of things. Uh, the first one is if I select it and say, uh, I, I'm gonna trust you guys a lot and give you a leader, leader owner. Uh, but when I start typing, notice that it's going to find the space. Now, if, if I was only using individual users, um, I can still come back here and say just Todd, but notice that it, it'll find the, uh, the group name just from that pick box. So I can add these members uh, to the permissions on the space as well, okay? And I just so, got a notification that happened. Yep, it's like instantaneous as soon as I do this. What's cool is if I've turned off the common space previously, and I, I add this to my, my members or to my, to my user group, um, basically when I have a new customer or a new customer, a new user come on, all I really need to do is send them an email for the invite, right? And we know we can do that. And I'm just gonna flip back because I, I like to, to show it and not, not point in directions, right? Um, so let's go back to the, uh, uh, platform management members. And so we, we, we invite users from here, right? By email. So if I invite my user from here, give it the email um, and add them to my group, my user group, technically they get their invitation, they get their licensing, and they're gonna get their permissions to the collaborative space. Technically, that's all they need to work with inside the platform. So in, in two steps, I can, add, I can add those users really easily. And that's why we're starting to do this in, as part of our, our, you know, our mid-grade implementation, the teams and the enterprise, is that it's so easy for me to set it up and, and make it uh, you know, really easy for the admin users to add users as they, as they grow. That being said, uh, there's something else that we typically do. And that is, so I have this other dashboard over here, my CAD user dashboard. Um, one of the other things that I can do is I can go into my settings here and I can grab my CAD user and share, and I can share this CAD user. There we go. So I can share this dashboard out as well. So again, part of our implementation, we generally create a user for CAD users, or I'm sorry, a user group for CAD users, and a user group for our typical web users. 
And it's not because we don't want them to have access. Well, it, it partially is because normally a web user doesn't have author rights into that space. They don't need to create content. They just need to view it. But really, the, the, the big thing is, is that we typically create a couple of different dashboards that make sense based on the workflow that that user is going to use or, or is going to be working in. And the CAD user workflow versus someone who's just viewing and maybe doing assignments and approvals, um, those two workflows generally um, work better with different dashboard layouts. So we create a dashboard for each of them. We push that out to all the users. Again, all I have to do, I still haven't changed the fact that all I have to do is add the, um, add the email to invite and add that email to the, to the user group. And the, the beauty there is that you can add that user group setting by email. They don't have to log in first and then you know me go back in there and add them to the user group. As long as you add them by email in both locations, you're good to go. So if I hit this and share, uh, my guess is you guys are probably gonna get another, uh, another uh, option that says your, your CAD user uh, is ready to be used. So let me flip back and make sure I've covered everything. I, I have, Technically, I'm out of time, but um, the other one, so we talked about adding this as dashboards, as, and I've, I'm sorry I flipped through that, but uh, the bookmarks and dashboards, we didn't talk about bookmarks. It's going to work the same way as the dashboard, right? So we can share a bookmark uh, to a specific group of users as well. Um, and then the other one, and I'm just going to flip forward here and let you see this. Uh, when we go into a route, so in this case, I, if I created a, an approval route, uh, the assignee option here, if I go ahead and, and key in the, the AE group, or in this case, if I had a separate user group that was just for my approvers, uh, you can see in this case, I had an inflow of approvers group from way back when. Um, I can add the assignee uh, to be a user group. Uh, so depending on who's available that day, this, uh, this, this task assignment will be queued up to the entire group. Someone picks it up goes ahead and makes that assignment and it's able to move forward with that route based on the group settings instead of an individual user. Again, this is a one-off route, uh, but it could be an approval route that we then add to that change action. Awesome. I am, I am under time, Nick. But I, if I can steal the last three minutes, are there any questions? None that I'm seeing as of yet. But yeah, it, awesome. if anybody does have any questions, please enter them in the chat or the QA section, uh, whichever one you have access to. Awesome. Excellent. So Schaefer, if you have any interjections during our portion, feel free to as well. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to give, I'm gonna change presenter to you or Todd, whose who's machine uh, is it coming off of? Me, put that on Bob. Thank okay. you. Make me do it. All right, should be coming over to you. Let's see, can you guys right. see the correct screen here? Yeah. Project Planner, yes, Coming through. Awesome, okay. So, let's see here. Just make sure I've got the right tools for the right job going on here. So. I like how so, my name is a lot bigger. Your name, and, Bob. And, and that's Thank intended. You. Thank you. you. You're doing more of the heavy lifting today, buddy. I'm 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 just here for moral support. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> I think it's funny that he's still got top billing though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it it just kind of it just kind of works out with with, with, yeah. with the design, you know? Yeah. I mean it just it just looks better if the longer name's up top. So <laughs> Yeah. So whatever. We might as well just kick this off. Um <laughs> Sounds good. We're going to take a look um, just a high level of this project planner role. Um, this is cloud-based project management tool. And just like you may be familiar with other project planning tools, you know, it has a graphical Gantt chart interface. Um, it's more for team-based projects, and it lets you do things that you would expect, right? You can define milestones. You can assign tasks to people. Uh, there's an, uh, a planning engine that runs in here 
that automatically will optimize activities that you've set up. So when you need to move a date for a due date, the uh, the tasks that you've assigned that have Slack built to them, into them, they may compress. Um, you may have to expand some things out, to give a little more space for some of your tasks. We're going to see this um, as we go through a, an actual demo of the software um, once we introduce this all to you. Um, it's more for small groups, uh, and it gets you out of like a top-down project management approach. It's more for the whole team. Everyone on the team is actually responsible uh, for the prog progress and success of these projects. Um, it is available with the standard collaborative business innovator role, but you get more functionality if you also have collaborative industry innovator, and that would allow you to actually attach data that's being managed in the cloud to particular tasks. So it can keep everyone connected and it helps you with your resource planning. Uh, everyone gets uh, an accelerated view of the, of the projects that they're working on based on the information that you're building into these tasks. So if you're not familiar with seeing collaborative tasks, we're also gonna show how those are created here. Um, the, the Gantt chart view within the app is gonna show you a project timeline, so we'll see that. We'll see building a milestone, we'll see attaching dependencies, and then we'll see how those kind of move around when we change the due dates of certain milestones. Uh, and then we'll go back and we'll review this summary dashboard, which is gonna show you the status of not only how many tasks you have, but what are the what's the project uh, progress of those tasks, if any have been completed, uh, or what's the percentage progress of certain tasks that we've uh, set up. So, Todd and I are going to wear a couple different hats in this scenario. Me, I'm Bob. I'm I'm going to be wearing the hat of the 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 project planner itself. I'm I'm going to be setting up the project, assigning some tasks to people, and watch it, watching that teardown happen. So, and then Todd on the other side of the fence is going to be wearing a couple of hats here. One is a designer, and one is a simulation person, and and walk through those aspects of how you interact with those plans and tasks. So, the first thing that we start off with is, say, marketing comes back to us and says we've got some information about the current design. Um, people are saying that it's a little too heavy. So, from that, we need to start a new project um, to do some weight reduction. So what I do is I go over into my project planning tool and I start a new project for weight reduction. And I put my explanation in what we're gonna do here and I can just drag and drop any icon on I want there. But once I do that, I can start creating tasks and inviting people. So in this situation, we, we like um, first name and your role, it just makes it easier. So. Um, Todd is going to be the analyst and the designer. I am the project manager. So the first thing we're doing here is we're starting a new task. Now, from the project planning aspect of this, we're creating the task, but it's being assigned to somebody and it's showing up into their list of tasks. So I come in and I say, I need to gather some requirements. It's going to be really important. So I'm going to give that person 10 days plus or minus three days to get the job done. And that starts filling things out. I can come in and assign a priority to it. Um, with that, it just kind of gives you some color coding, makes life a little bit easier to diagnose which things I need to really hit first. Um, there are a few other things that we can do with maybe um, here I can assign myself, I can assign Todd, Anybody that needs to be assigned to this, I can put that on there. I can also put um, informed people into this. So they're not really part of doing the day-to-day -day operations, but once that task is completed, they're informed as well. So they become an informed user. Calling back to that, uh, the, the members, you can actually add members based on those user groups as well. Yes, you can. So you could have a users group that is part of gathering gathering the requirements. Here, I'm going to have Todd do some benchmarking, or I can assign it to myself. So this is a competitive benchmark, not an actually FEA-based benchmark. So I'm going to do that myself, because I know that's part of my job. 
I'll come in and add another task in here for reviewing the prototypes. Only given about five days to get that done, and I'll sign that to myself as well. So Todd's going to gather the requirements. He's going to throw them over the fence to me, and then I'll take the time to get that done. With that being said, I really need to have these dependent on each other. So by just grabbing the end of um, the beginning of one task and dragging it to the end of another, I'm adding a dependency to that. And it's automatically stacking up the time required for this project by making those things happen one after another. I can assign a milestone here, basically saying this is one of our, our gateways to get the project done, or it could be the finishing of the project. So with, with that, just basically approving the project, and I'm, I can come in and assign it to a fixed date and time. So I can set that out maybe a, a few weeks, and I'll also say the, the milestone is dependent upon that last task. Now, if I adjust the time and I have to get it done, that first part of the project, it, uh, sorry, I, I paused a little early there, but you can see that first part is getting compressed quite a bit. So if I pull that back in even further, it's now compressing the rest of those milestones. You can see a double arrow indicates that there is massively more compression to that particular task compared to a single arrow that is just a small amount of compression. And that it's pulling that out of the slack, right? That's yeah, built that's into the it, task. Exactly. I gave, I gave um, you plus or minus three days on your gathering requirements and I gave myself the same amount of time on reviewing. So I only got compressed by like a day and a half. You got compressed almost by three. So there's, there's not much time for you to get your job done at this point in time. But luckily we're not, the due date isn't really that. So I'm gonna pull that back and you can see everything dynamically updates. So, so with that, I throw that over to you and you get your tasks. Right. Yep. So I have a new task. It's in to do, and I just dragged it there into in work. Uh, I can check the details, and um, what I'm going to do is I'll drag this PDF. Uh, these are the requirements that I've gathered. I'm going to drop that into the deliverables, and what happens is that's going to actually upload into the collaborative space uh, that's uh, designated for this project. Um, What's nice about this, these tasks, right? The tasks that are created are actual objects and they're saved in the same collaborative space as well. And you can go back and uh, interrogate those tasks. You can see what was attached to them. Um, and anything that was a part of those tasks then is going to be controlled data within the, the collaborative spaces. So I'll just go ahead and drop this in here. And, and that could uh, be any type of file, right, Todd? Right. Yeah, it doesn't have to just be a PDF. It could be um, a drawing, uh, JPEGs, uh, Word docs, things like that. Um, if it's most of the way done, but not all the way done, I can just set a percentage. You know, it's mostly done, 60 to 70 percent. And then I can go up and I can uh, save that task. It's going to keep my updates. And then I can send a little note to the project manager, Bob, here. Uh, please review and advise. And then when I yep. click that arrow, he's going to get the notification. So on my side of fence, I actually got a notification indicating that that happened. So I look over here. It says the analyst um, actually mentioned me in a comment, which is great. So he just hit the at symbol and typed my name in, and now I can go click on that, and it would take me to that. I already have my task open, so I can see the gathering requirements, and I can see that he's opened, he has a PDF that he attached. I can drag and drop that directly onto 3D Play. 3D Play isn't just for SOLIDWORKS documents or 3D objects. It can be used for 2D objects as well. So then, the great thing there is I could be on my phone in a, in an Uber coming from the airport and I can just grab my finger, circle around that and say, well, let's, let's review this section a little bit more. And I'll take a screenshot of that and attach that back to the task 
for him to continue reviewing. So I can just drag and drop on another attachment. This situation is just a, a PNG file and Todd gets that so we can continue working on the project. I didn't have to go fire up my computer. I just did that from my phone. So here I can see that, well, Todd made some comments. I'm gonna go ahead and tell him that looks fine. Let's go ahead and make some, an additional changes. Um, we still have some work to do on that, but that's okay. So if I look back at the project itself, it looks like we're doing pretty good. You can see the dark blue is indicating that we've got some of the project complete. The lighter blue is indicating stuff that still needs to be done, but I need to add a sub project to this. So you just go over to the right hand side, click add, and I can add in a sub project. And this is gonna be for actually modifying the front suspension because that's where we can carve out some weight. So with that being said, I'll add a couple tasks, maybe to myself, maybe to the designers to cut out some weight. It's gonna take a little bit. So I'll give them, give them about a week and a half to get that done work-wise, actually give them two weeks. And I'll also ask the FEA team after done with that to go back, look at that new design and verify that as well. Now, here's one of my favorites. I can come in and leverage a project that I did previously. So I could have like a 15 step project that I'd done previously and I like, I really like that one. I can bring a copy of that one going forward and reuse it. So I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. As an engineer, I like to beg, borrow and steal whenever possible, AKA make a copy of something and reuse it. That's what I'm gonna do here. So it goes, it finds a previous project and this was one that we did for our first modifications of the seat. That brings not only that project as a sub project, it also brings in the other tasks as well and who they were initially assigned to. So this, is a, this isn't the original, this is a copy. So now those tasks have already been assigned to those particular people to redo their previous work in a new way. I can also attach that I can move that wherever I want to, and you can see the time changes, just as I did previously. So that, that spools back up. If I need to, maybe that validation needs to be part of the seat modification. I can drag a task from another project into a completely different project that still has the dependencies. If I wanna remove those, I can, but you can see there that the time on that particular task was fixed. So by dragging into this new project, it says, hey, that task is a fixed amount of time. You made it less dynamic. So it's, it's informing me that I won't get the compression of those tasks if I say it's a fixed date, no plus or minus time on it. So after that, I'm gonna throw that over to Todd because now he's got these new assignments that he needs to go back, do some redesign inside of SOLIDWORKS and then throw it over to himself again as an FEA person and validate that. <laughs> right, all right, so um, we're gonna look at the same task interface that we saw through the browser, but this time while I'm in the context of designing within SOLIDWORKS and really this, interface is a browser window. It is just built into SOLIDWORKS and it's keeping up to date with what's happening on the platform, just like Chrome or Edge or whatever browser that you're using when you're in that web environment. Um, it works all the same and we, you don't have to leave this environment to go take care of those tasks. Um, so from my to-do list, right, I see that I need to reduce the weight of the suspension. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that task and I'm going to initiate that. Uh, when I take a look inside there, the details, I'm going to see that it's got a high priority, but I've already completed a lot of this work. So I'm just going to attach my assembly as a deliverable uh, that Bob can see live, right? So this is a and cat. You're just, 
you just yeah. type in the name of the model in and it's doing a search for you. That's right. And then I just choose the right result and hit done. And then we can go see what that looks like in the uh, back in the browser, right? I've updated my progress to 50%. So we can see that dark blue is showing the amount of progress that I've made. Um, now to complete that task, all I need to do is save the updated model back up to the platform. So I'll drag that assembly, right? It's not currently in my session. I can drag it from the deliverables into my SOLIDWORKS session and it's gonna download that and open it into my current SOLIDWORKS session. And and Todd, um, I don't know about you, but this is like how I actually like to work with the platform the most because this allows me inside of the SOLIDWORKS user interface without even going into a web browser, the ability to get to my tasks, my tasks have my assemblies that I'm working on right there. If I don't have a local copy of it, it just downloads it for me immediately and I don't have to go search for it. Well, that's right. And it's also just keeping track of my local copy and comparing it to what's in the cloud. And there's a dozen different ways to find what you're looking for from here. If it's not in a task, you've got your search options, you've got bookmarks. There's lots of ways to continue to work all within SOLIDWORKS without leaving the environment. Awesome. All right, so once this is downloaded and uh, active, I can just go through and uh, save the updates. So just gonna do a quick select here. And let's see here. This should uh, select. <laughs> The, the ones that have updated. Sorry about that. That's okay. And then what I'll be able to do is I'll switch back into the collaborative tasks widget and I'll drag that to done and Bob will get a notification that that task is now complete. Now when we switch back into the project planner, we can see uh, that task turns gray and we can get a summary of you know the summary dashboard will show us how many tasks are currently uh, in this project, uh, what, how many are in the to-do column, how many are in progress, and how many have been completed. So that one task uh, that I just moved to the done column is now complete. So in one user interface, you have an overall summary of everything that's going on with the project. You can immediately go and look at the tasks and how they break down in the project. You can see the the Gantt chart schedule of that, you can add members to that project, informed users and everything else. And probably one of my favorites, which if, if I got time, uh, we'll have to see, um, you can actually go back and see content of the project. So any files that have been uploaded to the project, those are also there for the project manager to see at a high level. He doesn't have to go through um, every task to find them, which is also nice. And that just brings us to our summary here. So what Project Planner is bringing us is that graphical, intuitive, team-based approach to plan and execute your projects. Um, the interface is very familiar uh, to SOLIDWORKS users and project users. Um, CAD users can minimize bouncing into different applications by staying within SOLIDWORKS and have access to all the tools they need. Uh, it's a traceable way to connect your CAD designs to projects through the tasks, uh, you get the real-time feedback on how the progress is developing. So Bob gets notifications when I move something around or when I send him a notification by chatting to him through the tasks. I see the same types of updates on my end when he adds new attachments and comments back to me. Um, all this functionality can be accessed, like Bob was saying, you can do it on his phone. You can do it from any device as long as you have an internet connection. Um, the CAD requires possibly um, you know, a workstation, but just to interface with the data and progress things through um, a workflow, you can do that all from your phone or tablet or Chromebook, however. So so Keith, I, I know you're, you're you're sitting there, but you're on mute. Um, any any feedback on on this? So I have a couple of things. I learned something new today. I, I I've never played with that the compression piece of it. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool, huh? It's pretty awesome. 
Um, and the only other one that I have is, is you know, your example here uh, works with a single project. Um, but in my case, I, I deal with, you know, anywhere to up to a dozen, uh, 18 projects at a time. And when you're in that project, uh, so when you go to collaborative tasks, you can drag, or, drag and drop the, or search for a project and put it in the context and basically narrow your collaborative task to just that project. So if you're working on just one project and you don't wanna see all of the other tasks that are going on in other projects, especially if you're the owner of that, of That's those right. other projects, um, it's really easy to narrow it down and get kind of that laser focus on what you're trying to work on. Yeah, that's that's really nice. And um, as as a Sour user on the, on the Sour side of things, I can create my own task using the collaborative task right inside the Sour's task pane, and I can add that to a project without having to go to the project manager and and say this this actually yeah. goes along with that and it builds up into the burn down for the project. And I think that, that in that case it, burnt, it it goes to the burn down but it also kind of goes to uh from a project management standpoint when I try if I were to copy that and create another project from it um I now can it can come back and say hey I, we had to add this task the last time is this something that I need to to leave in there is it something that I need to add to the new project um so that you can kind of over time uh, right. let your let your projects grow the way they they kind of would naturally mm -hmm. you kind of kind of organically build yeah. your own project templates right right so if you miss something in the first you know revision or the first edition of it uh, when you copy that you'll be able to copy that task along with it and you know the second version will probably account for it so it's kind of so, cool that way so in in your opinion there's there's also the the other side of the the fence there's the 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 project manager role that's out there sure. where where would you, where would you say that this tool stops and project manager picks up so i think that probably and there's a lot of there's a lot of differences between the two um i would say that when when customers are going to project manager they're probably looking for a couple of different things. The, the most common one is they're probably looking to do timesheets. So they, okay. they want to associate engineering time against a task and have their engineers do timesheets against, against specific tasks. Now, Project Manager works uh, with collaborative tasks just the way you say here. Um, I, I think that the, the widget on Project Planner is maybe a little bit cleaner. Um, but we can still do the Gantt stuff where you, you know, drag and drop to, to, to gain those interdependencies. Um, you know, Project Manager has the ability to capture uh, costs. So if you're looking okay. to associate costs with the project, uh, that's another, you know, there, there's several areas in which that Project Manager uh, kind of goes a little bit farther. Um, I think one of the other ones is that Project Manager can, uh, if you wanted to, uh, can integrate with uh, Microsoft Project. So if you're using Microsoft Project now and you want that sync between the two, but you still want to be able to capture, in my opinion, in both of these products, uh, the beauty of it is the fact that I can attach uh, the CAD, CAD models directly yeah. to those tasks and drag and drop off of them uh, in order to open it in SolidWorks and make edits and changes. It makes it super simple that you're not trying to pass files back and forth. Even You know, even... Uh, if you were using some type of PDM, um, trying to to push links to to CAD models is painful. Uh, if you just assign a task, that comes up in that task pane in SolidWorks, and you can drag and drop that stuff into the into the active pane. It's awesome. Yeah, because when when Todd typed in the name of the SolidWorks file, he wasn't just attaching a copy of it. He was actually t copying a dynamic link to that physical product on the platform. So as that updates, you get the updates in that that collaborative task, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, and Project Planner has come a long ways. I mean, they're constantly adding stuff to it. Like for example, I didn't know that they 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 were able to do that uh, that compression thing. I yeah. mean, that's that's awesome. They're constantly adding to this. Um, you know, some of the things that I think they they'll also add in time here is the ability to um, to take a task and add a change action as a deliverable. And in the project manager, if you if you complete the change action, it will automatically roll up the task as completed. 
So oh, again, yeah. you start to get that deliverable roll up and you get that real time tracking at the top level of the project that a lot of those managers are looking for. Yeah, I think you can attach a change action today, but yeah. you it does not execute yeah. the completion of said change action yet. So right. once once we get to that point, that would be amazingly slick. Yep, for sure. So any anything else, buddy? I don't think so. Okay. I mean, if there's well, something in the questions, does anybody, I, I can't see the chat for whatever reason. I don't see the Q&A either. I, I don't know if there's anything queued up uh, or if anyone I mean, has, has thrown anything one, out there. One of the few chats I saw was, this is awesome by Keith Schaefer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was that compression one. I'm like, I, I didn't even know that we could do that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Now I'm going to go play with it. <laughs> just, just make sure that you, you give it some plus or minus time. You got to well, give it a plus I... or minus tolerance. So, so that's that's what we got. I think we may have gone over time just a little bit, but um, I think this is all beneficial stuff. Keith, great job on the users group stuff. Yeah, I'm, you guys too. I mean, that's 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 really cool. I mean, watching it happen real time as I logged into that particular tenant for the first time was was pretty amazing. So, but um, let's see. Anything else before we need to close close it out, gentlemen? I don't think so. If you guys have questions um, or you want to see more on any of these topics, be sure to to give us a call, either your sales rep or or the general general line. Um, we're happy to uh, to go over it with you. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody for for coming today. And if you have any questions, like Keith said, don't hesitate to give us a buzz. All right. Well, with with uh, presentation complete, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, thank you all so much for attending, and we'll see you guys next time.